Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the fourth Bristol Zoological Society free online conservation lecture. And the theme of these lectures is stories from the field. And today we've got my colleague and boss, uh, Dr. Daphne Karawas, who's going to talk about conservation in the Philippines. Before we get to that, she looks very excited. Um, I'm just going to do a little bit of housekeeping. Um, firstly, um, Daph assures me that uh, there are not going to be any gory images, so the lecture should be child friendly. Um, the lecture is being recorded as we speak, um, and it's also going live to Bristol Zoo's Facebook page. So if you have any problems um, accessing the lecture through Zoom, or if you know of people that have problems, um, please try to access it through our Facebook page. Um, and the recording will be made freely available to everyone afterwards. Um, on the screen, you'll see that I've put up um, the Bristol Zoological Society um, donation page. As you know, the zoo's been closed due to coronavirus, and if you wish to support us by donating, then you can go to that website and do so. Um, so as ever with housekeeping, um, please be nice to one another, and please be nice to the speaker when you, when you ask questions. Um, please um, uh, remain muted and keep your videos off during the lecture if possible. Um, and at the end of the lecture, there'll be time for you to ask questions. Um, it's possibly, if you, if you wish to do so, if you have a look on your screen, you should see several um, videos of, of the presenter and the speakers and so forth. At the top of those videos, there are different options. And I would recommend that you choose the sm uh, show small active speaker video option because that way um, the videos won't cover up the, the presentation. Um, and that's about it. So without further ado, I'm going to unshare my screen and I'm going to welcome Daphne to start her talk. And I'm going to unmute myself maybe. That'll be better. Shall I share my screen, Mark? Yes, go for it. Um, can you see it all right? Yep, it looks perfect. Yeah. Lovely. Okay, I'm gonna make a smaller screen. Okay, right. Um, so thank you so much for, for coming. Uh, this evening to uh, to our lecture to our fourth uh, conservation lecture. Um, so this is my first time that I do a lecture on Facebook Live on Zoom. So uh, just bear with me, and if you have any questions or um, any comments at the end of the talk, I will be very happy to answer any questions you may have. Um, all right. So today I want to talk to you about um, so like our conservation project in the Philippines. And, um, and it's basically, uh, the title is How to Care for a Bleeding Heart because our flagship species is a bleeding heart dog. And I will talk a little bit more about what is a flagship species and what is a necklace bleeding heart dog. Um, so yeah, welcome everybody. So a bit about me. So I am a, a higher education manager and also the Philippine, Philippine project leader. Uh, I've been working in Bristol Zoological Society since 2013, so quite a while. Um, what does I mean higher education manager is quite opaque, um, but basically I oversee our, uh, the Bristol Zoo's higher education provision. So we teach in the zoo um, foundation, bachelor and master degree, and I oversee uh, the partnership with the university that we teach it with. And I also oversee uh, all the logistic bits of it. So. That's a higher education provision. I also design and implement, with the help of my colleagues, a conservation action in the Philippines. So we have uh, uh, we are able to channel funding, and then we try to design and implement this conservation action in this project. Now, background about me: I'm French, as you may hear, uh, with my accent. Um, I ha I'm actually a primatologist by training, uh, which is funny because I lead a project on on the bird and and the pig, but you know. Um, all knowledge is transferable. Uh, so by training, I'm a primatologist. So I did uh, worked a lot in the field. So I worked on white-faced capuchins uh, in Costa Rica. I was looking at 
juveniles um, social transmission, so like learning about how to process fruits from uh, between juveniles and adults. And I stay one year in Costa Rica. I stay six months in Nigeria, Nigeria sorry, looking at olive baboons uh, grants. So it's type of vocalization that do. Uh, and looking at their social context and see whether the grants were changing according to the social context. And I did my PhD in Indonesia. I stayed two years there and I studied crested macaques. Uh, so you can see the picture of all these species on the right. And the crested macaques is the one that is uh, smiling and doing a selfie. It's quite famous because it did a, um, it's called the selfie monkey uh, because allegedly uh, this uh, macaque, which actually I know the name, Naruto, um, pressed the button of a picture of a camera and uh, took a picture of himself smiling, which is actually was not a selfie at all. He was actually uh, looking at the, um, the reflection and uh, doing a, a greeting to the, to the monkey that he could see in the reflection of the camera. And throughout this experience, I always noticed a lot of conservation threats. And, uh, and that's actually what uh, drive me to away a little bit from the fundamental research and towards the conservation and the applied conservation, actually. So trying to apply conservation, to try to find solution to threats. I'm also part of the IUCN um, uh, Species Survival Commission for uh, the group of Southeast Asia primates. And uh, IUCN, if, if you not know, it's an international union for conservation of nature. It's a great source for learning a little bit more about primates, um, sorry, species all around. Uh, primates too, but all species. So really good resource if you want to have a look and know more about um, conservation. Now, do let me know, Mark, if I speak too fast. <laughs> um, so at Bristol Zoo, we have a conservation master plan that we published in 2018. So from 2018 to 2022, we have a master plan that is actually guiding our conservation work. Uh, and this is with each and every project that we have uh, at Bristol Zoo, and it's helping us um, guide and organize our initiatives for each project. And our plan is actually uh, through three different strands, three different approaches. So we have uh, breeding threatened species, which is what traditional zoo do, so conservation breeding, so trying to um, make sure that uh, we are making sure that there is species if, even if they're extinct in the wild, we are breeding them in captivity. We are also carrying out field conservation and research, and that's a little bit more what I'm going to talk to you about today. And uh, this is uh, led by a conservation scientist uh, within Bristol Zoo. And finally, we have also a behavior change, zoo action, and advocacy. And this is uh, about promoting pro-conservation behavior uh, to our visitor and to the wider public, which is a part of what we are doing tonight. Uh, and uh, for example, our current uh, campaign is to support um, certified sustainable, certified sustainable palm oil. So, uh, and I will talk a little bit more about this later on actually. So this is one of our big campaigns this year is to try to promote sustainable palm oil. Now to the crux of our topic, the Philippines. Um, the Philippines is a really interesting country actually. It's a huge country. Uh, in terms of size, it's about one third more than the UK. Uh, it's about the length of Italy, uh, but it's double the population of Italy, actually. There are 7,600 islands. Uh, it's the 12th most populated country in the world. It's really, really a lot of people. And actually, Manila is the most densely, densely populated city in the world with 41,000 people by square kilometer. Uh, there is multiple ethnicity because there's, of course, many islands and many ethnicity, many dialects and many cultures. Uh, it's very rich in this aspect. It's also a, a very special place in the world because it's the only place in the world that is both a biodiversity hotspot. So what does that mean? That means that there is a biodiversity that is threatened with destruction. So it's a very high biodiversity that is threatened. So it's a biodiversity hotspot and a mega diverse country, which means uh, that's one of the 17 countries that harbor the majority of Earth species. And that's the only place in the world which is both of these aspects. Um, and they say that apparently it's actually two thirds of Earth's biodiversity is contained in this country. So it's a very important um, place, actually. And each of these areas within the Philippines, there is faunal regions. So that's regions that are very specific fauna. Uh, because they were um, separated for a very long time. 
And our project focused on the Visayas, which is a region uh, which is the little insert you can see. So you can see on the left the map of the Philippines. And on the right, you can see uh, three different islands. One is Negros and one is Panay. So the Negros one looks a bit like a fruit. And you have Panay and you have uh, Masbate Kitikao. But we are focusing on Negros and Panay. And you can see the round, uh, red round, which is south of Negros, our main field site, and north of Negros, another main field site, and northwest Panay, which we're um, focusing on right now as well. So, and I will talk to you a little bit about what we found in these three field sites. All right, so that's an introduction to the Philippines. And this is a picture of uh, the Manticil village in the south of Negros. Um, we worked very long time there. Uh, and, uh, and basically, this is a picture of, of the area. And it's quite telling, actually, because um, we, so the Philippines has suffered a huge amount of deforestation in the last hundred years. Um, it's about 10 million hectares of forest was lost. So, and this is due to partially the colonization of the Spanish and the Americans and uh, also development. And so 70% of coverage, there was a hundred years ago, sorry, there was 70% of forest coverage and now it's down to 20%. So it's a huge uh, deforestation. And it was not even like, um, selective logging where you just like target big trees that you're interested in that are very precious, but it was just like cutting everything. Um, so, and in the islands where we work is actually down to 4% of forest coverage, but it still harbor a huge amount of endemic species and that makes it very important. Uh, this also, this village is interesting as well because as you can see, it's uh, in the mountains, it's quite far. Uh, it's about uh, 1,200 meter high. Um, it's uh, very hard to reach. Uh, it's four hours, no, sorry, six hours by motorbike. And um, so because the roads are not good, even in dry season, you can't really reach the, the village with a, with a car. And, and so you have to sit in a motorbike, usually not alone uh, on this motorbike because they try to have about four or five people sitting on the same motorbike and uh, quite um, painful. And here as well, you have, there is running water because it comes from the forest and from the mountains, but there's no electricity. So it's actually quite a hard life that people live there. Oopsie, I'm just going too fast. So in the Philippines in general, and of course in the Visayas, there is a gorgeous amount of, uh, of um, uh, there's a huge amount of gorgeous species. And these are an example of few species that we have there. You have a Visayan leopard cat on the top left, uh, which is nocturnal, very shy. Um, but we are able to actually see uh, in the camera traps, and I will talk to you more about what is camera traps. Uh, there is the Wilden's own bill, very important, critically endangered, the Philippine scopes owl, which I've seen actually in, in the wild, fantastic species. Um, the uh, crimson sunbird. We have the Visayan's was spotted deer as well, which is really hard to see in the wild. And, and, um, uh, it's very, very, very critically endangered as well. And then the two main um, star of our show tonight is uh, the Visayan Warty Peak on top right, which is hosted actually in Bristol Zoo. So when Bristol Zoo open, uh, you will be able to see these species there, uh, gorgeous species, very interesting. And on the bottom right is the Negro Speeding Hard Earth, which is our flagship species. So now a little bit more about uh, these two species. So the Negro Spinning Hard Dove is a, is a very elusive species, a very shy species. Um, it's about 88 individuals in captivity right now, currently. Uh, there's only two organizations that are uh, breeding these species in the world. So, and only eight, 88 individuals. And it's thought to have about 240 individuals in the wild. Uh, but our assessment, our, we are doing current assessment right now, and it's probably less than, much less than that. Uh, it's critically endangered, endangered the Negros Pinning Heart, and it occurs only on Panay and Negros Island in the Philippines. Um, it's quite an unassuming pigeon when you look at the picture, but it has this very beautiful uh, uh, red spot on the chest. And so when they call, the red spot uh, enlarge a little bit. Um, I was lucky enough to see this. Uh, it's a bit, it's stories in the field, right? So I'm telling you stories a bit. So I was very lucky to see this species in the wild. Um, it's uh, quite hard to see. And we were in the area where all the birders go to try to see it. And so uh, I woke up, so we, it was the last day of the, the field for me. I had to go back to Bristol. 
And I woke up early and I took one, one uh, bird guy with me, Put Put, uh, which is uh, one, uh, one of the two best bird guy. Um, and we went only the two of us because I wanted to make sure that we were very quiet and we, uh, you know, increase our chance to see it. And I played this call, which I'm going to try to play with you. Um, I play this call, which is kind of like a usual um, uh, method to do in, in birding, is that you play the call and you hope that the, the bird will basically reply back. Um, so it's a territorial call and then you play it and then the males may be like, you know, they act to this call and say, no, no, this is my territory, you should not go there. Can you hear anything? Yes. So I played this call over and over again, um, and we were walking this dry river bed, hoping that we could see it. And, um, and basically, we walk up and down the dry river bed. This is the place where all the people mostly see this bird when they see it. And it was getting 1 p.m., so one, 1 in the afternoon, and I could see Put Put being a bit stressed because I was trying, I was losing faith. I was uh, quite sad, um, and I was really wanting to see it. And at one point, we just played again, and, um, and then he heard it. We just, like, fall on the ground, um, and then we hide behind the log, and then we went command the style on all four to get closer to the bird, hiding behind the log as well. And then, finally, I was able to see it. It was he was calling back, so we were engaging in this kind of conversation. And, uh, and I get close enough to be able to do a footage a video. And uh, this is the video of the footage. Um, it's quite shaky, my apologies. It's, uh, I was actually not too far away from this bird. I was about 10 meters away. I was trying to hide and shoot and hide and shoot. Um, and then when this bird uh, was, uh, saw me, then he just um, did this uh, usual behavior, which is they move ahead and then just poof, fly away. So I stayed about uh, 20 minutes with this bird and it was very exciting and uh, I was very happy about this. So the negro splitting hard of, bottom line, very shy species, uh, very hard to see, very sensitive to humans and humans disturbance. Uh, this is one of the pictures that we have a negro splitting hard of uh, nest. It's, there's not much knowledge actually on this species. Uh, we know it's a ground dwelling species, so it likes to be on the ground and it nests on rattan leaves, which is kind of a, a big leaf, a big, big fern that is about one meter high from the ground. Uh, breeding season is about March to June, uh, but in captivity actually we find that it breeds throughout the year. Uh, and the chicks fledge only 12 days after hatching, uh, and that's really fast. And probably it's due to the fact that the nests are quite vulnerable because they're just one meter high from the ground, they're not really hidden. Uh, they feed on plant material and possibly some, um, some ground invertebrates. And so that's really the necrospinning heart. What we believe is the big problem is um, deforestation and uh, habitat loss. Um, so as you can hear, it's quite elusive and it's quite shy and it probably just stay uh, deep in the forest and don't get close to like the, the hedge, the edge of the forest. And, um, and so in this picture, you can see that there's just, you know, a big green part and then the forest behind. The big green part is, is, um, is not actually agriculture. So what happens is that forest is cut for agriculture conversion, especially uh, there in the Philippines. Here, the, the, um, uh, the, the, the conversion happened. So there was the tree that was cut and then they, the people planted the uh, crops and such. And then the, 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 the agriculture was a bit too intensive and so the nutrients was lost. And then there is this grass called Kogan grass. Uh, so, and this grass actually invaded the area. So now this area that we see in, um, in clear green is not used for anything. So it's not, it's not good use for biodiversity and it's not good use for agriculture. So that's a really tragedy actually. Um, so we believe that the main threats of the necro spinning hard dove is deforestation. But again, we have to find some more information about this. Now the second uh, species that we're really interested in the Philippines is this, uh, this really uh, cool animal, the Visayan warty pig. And this is actually a picture of Elvis which is uh, uh, the male pig that we have in Bristol Zoo. Um, you can see it's quite cheap here, I'm sure. And is uh, critically endangered as well. Uh, Visay and Warty pig are really interesting species. Um, here is a footage of one of our camera traps. Um, and 
camera traps are actually, so Bushnell is the, the type of, uh, the brand of camera trap that we use there. And you can see a little baby on the bottom right, uh, jumping around, which has like little stripes. Um, so basically, these are NYT pig live in groups of four to six. Uh, they have a diet of roots and fruits, and, they, uh, and you can observe piglets uh, during dry season uh, from January to March. And it's about three to four pig piglets per liter. Um, I actually seen one warty pig in uh, the area where we work. Uh, it was about one second and a half, uh, just uh, boom, running away from me, uh, 10 meters, 15 meters away, just like, just dashing. But I could see, I could hear a little bit the sound and, and just see the, the shadow running away. Um, this and warty pig are, are very interesting and very important for, for, white, for the biodiversity there. Uh, the main threat is basically um, uh, hunting. So this is another camera trap that we took um, in the same area, actually, in the same dry riverbed. And uh, these are hunters. Hunting is illegal in the uh, in Philippines, and especially because this is in a, a protected area in a national park. Uh, this video is interesting because it can tell us a few things. So it can tell us what time, uh, where people were. Uh, we can also see that the guns are partially homemade, but there is some, uh, it's, it's not like, they are, they are quite uh, developed guns as well. We also observed in the area some uh, bushmeat hunting, uh, some, sorry, some traps and some snares. Um, now, what is interesting about this threat is that, so bushmeat hunting or hunting for, for meat, for food, can be either for sustenance or for commercial use. So sustenance will mean that you hunt for your family and you eat yourself, you consume it, and it's your input on protein or commercial use will be, uh, you will sell it in the market. Um, selling, sell it in the market means that it could be used as a prestigious thing. So, you know, it's very fancy food and you serve it at Christmas or big events. Or it could be that um, people want to eat it and, and people away from, from the area where they're hunted. And so we don't know yet what is this. So what are the drivers of bushmeat hunting? Is this sustenance or is it commercial trade? Um, but this is probably the main uh, threats to the visa and warty pigs, which is quite different from the necrospinning harper. So what are we trying to tackle? Um, what, what are we trying to do actually to tackle these two main threats? Um, we have five different approach to tackle these uh, threats. And I will explain a little bit more in detail uh, each of the actions that we are doing um, be behind this term. So, we are trying, we're surveying, so field survey. So we're collecting data in, in the forest um, about the species. We're also trying to implement alternative livelihood. And I will talk to you more about this. We're also implementing advocacy, uh, trying to uh, promote uh, changes in, uh, um, among lawmakers. We are looking at reintroduction for the negro spinning hard dogs. So is there places, and also for the VZ and WTP actually, is there places where we can reintroduce them and protect them where they're introduced? And then we are a zoo, so we are uh, interested as well in captive breeding. And so how can we help uh, the captive center that's hosting the species and uh, promote captive breeding basically for uh, making sure that uh, there is a good, healthy um, captive population for each of the species. So on reef serving, um, so here you can see a picture on the left of uh, June uh, uh, crouching, I think you can say, and then June, uh, no, sorry, put put on the left with a hat, and June on the right, uh, taller, yeah, standing. And uh, these are our two bird, uh, bird guides, actually, they are not just bird guides, they are um, just a, a wealth of wisdom. June knows everything about the plants and the trees in this area. Um, and they know all the, the trails and, and everything. So they are, they are just fantastic. Uh, and uh, so we employ both of them. And you can see um, Put Put being proudly pointing at something strange attached to a, to a tree. And that's, uh, that's a camera trap. So I've been talking to you about camera traps, but I don't know if you know anything about camera traps. It's actually a weird little box, a camo color, but it's a video camera. And everything that passes in front of it will trigger this video camera. And uh, this will start recording anything that, um, it's a motion capture. So anything that moves, uh, that will start recording that. 
um, it's great for any species that are shy, that are elusive, that are nocturnal, really good for that because they can take also video during the night. So for example, the, uh, the leopard cat, the, the Visayan leopard cat that I showed you a picture earlier, we have few of these videos uh, on camera trap as well. Um, and, uh, and we will never be able to see this animal uh, if we didn't have a camera trap. Um, so that's really good. And so we deployed some of that in all our field sites, actually, uh, South, North, and uh, South, North Negros, and uh, Northwest Panay. And another method, a great fancy method that uh, is used for surveying or collecting data on the species of interest is the picture on the right is walking, a lot of walking. So, you know, you just walk in the forest, you try to do that. So you use transect. Uh, method. So that means that you walk on the straight line and you try to collect any kind of um, uh, sightings of the species of interest. Um, so this is a picture of, of us actually in January this year. Uh, very, very lucky to, boom, right before the lockdown, we got a little bit of survey uh, going on. So January 2020, we um, started the big survey with June Putput um, and uh, my two researcher Ilke and, uh, and uh, Holly. And, uh, and so, yeah, they did a lot of transects and walking in the forest in order to find out uh, more about trying to see the Negros Pinion Heart of and hear it. And also um, trying to see the Visayan Warty Peak. But as I said, the Visayan Warty Peak, because it's hunted, is going to try to avoid a lot of the humans, right? So usually with this type of species, you look at signs. Um, so rooting on the ground, so you can see like this place where they're just like searching for food, or so like um, a biting on the teeth on the tree. So usually indirect signs for this type of species. Uh, so yeah, so we are doing surveys and I'm going to talk to you about three surveys that we've done. So we did a menticule survey. And so that was in South Negros. Uh, it's quite a, a rough camp, as you can see. Uh, the two students that stay there uh, for a while, I, I stayed there for, for, um, for a week, but uh, the students that stayed there, they stayed there for nine weeks overall. And so they had like just uh, uh, like two houses to protect the tent for sleeping. And then the kitchen was on the, under the blue tarpaulin on the left, as you can see. Um, to, so it's protected by the water. The waterfall was close, so that was really good. Always important to come close to water. And uh, there was a generator as well for electricity. Uh, so you could charge you know, your uh, batteries and everything, your computer, everything to transfer the data. And so during this survey of nine weeks, uh, so that was 2017, uh, we found no necro spinning hard uh, Now we probably think that's because this was too high. So in the past, uh, People or researchers have thought that the necro spinning hard dove will go up to 1,200 meters of altitude. So rarely from 1,000 to 1,200, but this is probably stretching it. And this area is actually around 1,200 and it's probably too high for the necro spinning hard dove to thrive, at least in this area. Uh, we stayed four years, we had 12 camera traps and this nine weeks of survey and we never seen a necro spinning hard dove. So we're, we're pretty uh, confident that maybe this species doesn't occur. It could be because of the altitude. It could be also because other species are just uh, using the same niche, uh, eating the same food, nesting at the same place, and there's no space. Not sure. But yeah, we haven't seen it. However, one thing that we saw is that in this Manticule survey, we saw Visa and Warty Peak that was not only staying in the forest and nesting in the forest and rooting there, but also in the Kogan grass. So if you remember the picture earlier, I talked about this um, blank space of kogan grass, this invasive grass that took over the agriculture area because the nutrients were, were low. And we found a lot of signs actually of this visa and what's being in the kogan grass. So interestingly, what we think is that the main threat is maybe not habitat deforestation because this warty pig seems to use this habitat, but it's more about hunting. And so there were snares, there were traps in this area. There was uh, pictures of hunters with homemade gun uh, so this in so to tackle the threat of the cyan warty pigment is probably to help um, curb hunting. So that's a monticule survey. On the right you have the Sibelu survey, uh, and that's with our host Mark Abrams right there. He was there with me. Uh, yay! Fun times in the forest. Um, and so 2018, 
2018. And so Sibelu is the station there. It's uh, built and organized by Philincon, one of our partners. And it's a, it's a beautiful station, as you can see. It's, you know, quite different, the style of, uh, of living. Um, and I'm going to show you a little bit inside. Um, because I think it's always fun to see how people in the forest stays and how, how they live. So Sibelu is, uh, is been, has been there for a very long time, actually, uh, this house. Um, and it's uh, right in the middle of a protected area. And it's quite mountainous. So you get there about six hours hiking, six, seven hours, if, I'm, if you're slow like me. And, um, and so it's ups and downs, ups and downs. It's quite demanding. So you can see the nice shoes, a bit dirty. There is how many? There was like 12 river crossing last time I went there on dry season. So that's fun as well. Uh, getting your feet wet, never a, never a fun thing to do. And you can see on the top, then you have uh, the kitchen, so really comfortable and nice kitchen table. On the middle, uh, lower part of the picture, you have uh, my bedroom, uh, very nice. So you have private bedroom, you have a plank on wood, so you can sleep with a little mat, fantastic. And you're very protected by the, from the rain, yeah, very nice as well, this is important. And then the kitchen on the right, with plenty of ketchup sauce, as you can see. Um, ketchup sauce travels a lot. Um, and and yeah, gas, gas cooking. So you don't have to collect the wood. You don't have to worry about any of this. And so in the Sibelu station, then we uh, endeavor to look at the type of biodiversity that was living around this area, uh, and especially the Negros Pinerada. So we, de we deployed some camera traps, and, uh, and we wanted to look at the wildlife and the threats. And so, so I told you before that you know, the video that I did, uh, quite shaky, of Negros Pinerado was like one of the first video ever. And we also were able to collect uh, a camera trap footage, which is the first camera trap footage ever of a Negros Pinerado as well, which is quite exciting. Um, and as you can see, the bird seems really not bothered at all with the camera trap, so that's really fantastic because it, so that doesn't stress them either. Um, what we find is that actually, so after that, so along with this study, then we had, uh, um, we had the fantastic students, Holly, that uh, looked at the habitat preference of these species and looking at where do we see these species and which type of forest do we like, yeah? What are the factors that um, promote or increase our chance to see them? Because once we know that, then we can um, organize our conservation action and try to promote this type of forest. And so what we found is that the understory cover, so that means the leaves that goes up to one meter or one meter and a half from the ground, so that's understory. So the understory cover and the canopy cover, so canopy cover is the crown of the trees and how much like, um, how much sun is going through and whether it's very covered or not. So both of these, understory and canopy cover, has to be very high for this species to occur. It's a bit strange, uh, in all honesty, because usually what you see is that understory, understory cover is quite thick in secondary forests. So forests that have gone through a little bit of, um, of uh, depletion of trees. And canopy cover is quite high in primary forests, but it's not vice versa. So in primary forests, you have high canopy cover and low understory cover. In secondary forests, you have high understory cover and high and low primary cover, uh, canopy cover. Do I make sense? Ish. Um, so yes, yeah, so that's surprising because basically these species have a very specific um, preference of habitat, and maybe they quite like to be in the ver in the verge in the edge of primary and secondary forests where all these habitats are overlapping. So that's interesting, uh, and that's something we learned as well because it's quite exciting to learn something about a species that is so unknown. Um, and based on that, so we have our bio archive preprint. Based on that, then we are trying to um, uh, do a species modeling to locate uh, the area of conservation importance for future conservation effort in rural Negros and old Panay, so that we know where we should really focus and where we should protect the area. One of the things that we find is that, as it confirms a little bit what we thought about the altitude uh, from the previous survey, is that this species likes lowland forest, so forest that is not too high in altitude. Why is this tricky? Is because usually in 
many, many places in the world, lowland forest is the first thing that gets converted into agriculture or into um, habitation, or like, you know, living and uh, accommodation and stuff, because it's the easiest to reach, it's the first, it's usually flat, kind of flat. And so it's the first thing that, that goes, that leaves, that gets destroyed. Um, now, why is this lowland forest not destroyed? Good question. Uh, it's protected area, but also and mainly is because it's within a mountainous area. So there is mountains before you actually reach the area where the lowland is. So it's quite protected in the middle of a protected forest. Okay. Now, third um, survey that we did, so the one that we did in January 2020, on this January, is I call it bivouac survey. So I know that's a French word, uh, but I quite like it. Uh, bivouac means camping, and I think it's sometimes used in English, uh, but I might pronounce it in the wrong way. Yeah, so I don't know, bivouac, I'm not sure. Um, so bivouacing or bivouacing is basically camping around the forest. And uh, we're quite excited because that was the first time ever that this survey was done in this area in the Northwest Canai. Uh, basically serving the whole protected area and not only the area around Sibelu station, which is easier to leave because there's the field station, etc. But we really wanted to spread and understand how is the whole uh, area. Um, bivouacking means camping and camping means usually a hammock tent and I will really advise you to try it out. Uh, usually the first night you don't sleep too well, but then you get used to it and then it becomes very comfortable. So on the picture on the left up, and you can see this tent that is kind of like banana shape with a nice net on top. And then you put a big tarpaulin, which is the picture on the right up, which protects you from the rain because it's going to rain a lot. You're in the rainforest, it's going to happen. It, it rained every night when we were there for uh, five days. Um, and actually my tent uh, was a little bit sticking out. So I got a little bit of drops during the night. And when I felt that, I was like, okay, good. And I, I hide under my sleeping bag. Um, but fairly dry. I mean, it's fun after. <laughs> During the time, it's not too fun, but it's okay. Um, low bottom left is uh, the kitchen, so really protected by the leaves, very important. So trying to have a, a, a fire to, to eat, really. And uh, right is us eating uh, rice and cans, um, because that's the thing that it's super heavy, to be fair, when you transport them and you have to hike. But um, you can't go away without eating rice in the Philippines. It's, it's just a no-go. And, uh, and so, yeah, so no electricity there at all. Um, and the bivouac, so I went to one bivouac, but few, lots of bivouacs were established, and they were established always close to the river or to, to a water point as well. Um, yeah, and basically tarpaulin is really important and very good, and next time I will buy much more of that. Now is a picture of uh, that Mark actually did. Thank you, Mark, um, of uh, Northwest Panay and our uh, survey. Um, and so our survey was uh, basically throughout. So you can see like it's really throughout the protected area. So the protected area is taking the whole peninsula, as you can see. It's, the, it's around. So like it's all the grid cells is protected area. And uh, the students there, Holly and Ilke, they did 24 bivouac, which is fantastic. So they hiked everywhere and they were able to establish a bivouac and stay for uh, three, four days in each BV and then, uh, or bivouac, sorry, and then uh, do the data collection around this bivouac. Um, and so we tried to visit as many grid cells as we, as we could. Uh, overall, for the two months they were there, because after that there was a lockdown, of course, so it kind of stopped us in the middle. But for the two months they were there, they were able to do 68 kilometer transect, which is huge in this area uh, because it's so mountainous and it's so difficult. Usually you will be able to do just one kilometer transect a day, uh, which seems hilarious in like the UK or even in places where like I have a friend working in Cameroon and he's like, what? One kilometer a day? It's crazy. You do that in two hours, but no, uh, you need a day there. It's very demanding, but it's fun. Uh, and then they did 332 point counts. Uh, so point counts is a great method for, uh, for collecting information on birds. You basically sit in one place and collect all the birds that you can hear for a set amount of time here, 10, ten minutes. Um, so we recorded 22 times the Negro Spinning Harder, which is not much actually thinking about the survey effort that has been done. And we collected overall 54 unique bird species with the help of our bird uh, 
bird guide, obviously, yeah, very good to have. Uh, they're skilled bird guides, they're fantastic guys, actually. And uh, also, we observed uh, several plantations in the protected area, so coconut plantation and traps and snares. Uh, this is going to help us to also establish, so we want to establish a population estimate of the species we're interested in, so the design of the and the negotiating hot dog. Uh, we want also to um, understand which area they prefer, yeah, so the type of habitat that they are and such. But we also want to understand the pressure in the protected area. So if we see that in the upper um, grid cells, we have um, a lot of plantation, a lot of traps and snare, but this can guide us actually to um, actually uh, carry more conservation initiatives in, in the north of the peninsula. So we want to do a, a threat, um, um, threat hotspot kind of thing. So a, a threat map of where are the places we can see the most threats and then organize our efforts around the communities uh, that are close to these areas. So going from survey, so that was the survey part. So we do a lot of surveys in there, but that's not the only thing we are trying to do because I don't, I think that um, we can tackle the threats through different perspectives. And so we also doing alternative livelihood. So we carried out a, a month pilot research to assess um, project livelihood that was impl implemented by someone else than us actually. And there was five different projects that was implemented in the Northwest Panay. And so we want to check which of this, um, of this livelihood actually been successful. And based on this information, then possibly either go to look at other livelihood or potentially fund a livelihood that has been useful for, for the local community. Um, and so we have now a good idea of, of what, what data to collect and how. Now we have to raise some funds to get uh, this alternative livelihood project on, on the go and, uh, and also some researchers. So if anybody is interested, email me. Um, and based on the output and preliminary survey that Mark actually did in 2018, where he talked to um, fishermen and farmer and um, village captain and, bir and the bird guides or tourist guides, uh, we have a little bit of an idea of what is the perception of wildlife there. And, um, and yeah, so basically that's what we would like to do. Um, what is important in alternative livelihood is really, so we want to alleviate the threats on biodiversity, but we also want to really understand what the people need there. So what do they need? Are they hungry? Do they struggle to find food? Because if this is something that happens, then the way that we approach bushmeat hunting is gonna be very different, right? Um, is it also like problem with education? So do they have like, do they need teacher salary? Uh, do they need papers and pens? Do they need school buildings? Uh, do they have access to medical care? Is, is, there, is there a problem there or not? Um, so really understanding what do the people need there and how we can um, try to improve their quality of life as well as, implement, as alleviate um, threats in biodiversity. But it's really always trying to, to help the people uh, having a better life and something and also the solution that we propose have to be easier and more lucrative uh, because it's only when these two aspects are present that there will be any behavior change which is the same here in the UK or in France. Um, of course as I said we are really interested in understanding the drivers of bushmeat and uh, whether you know how much does uh, so is the warty pig meat sold in the market how much does it cost? Is it more expensive or cheaper than uh, regular uh, pig meat? Uh, is it rather consumed by the family, as I said, or is it rather sold? Uh, so, but only when we understand the need of a local community around the protected area, then we can try to design projects that benefit both wildlife and people. And it's a big aspect of this Philippine project that uh, we really want to, to focus on in the next years. Uh, going on now, passing to captive breeding, and I'm happy to answer any questions you have here. Yeah? So captive breeding, so look at this fantastic picture of Shani. Uh, so it's Shanika Ratnayake, and if you listen to this talk, I'm very sorry butchering your name, Shani. Um, but uh, Shani is uh, here on the picture with Elvis, uh, Visa and Warty Pig in Bristol Zoo. Uh, she is, uh, she's a head keeper at Bristol Zoo, and uh, she knows a lot about the Visa and Warty Pig. And so she went in December uh, 2019 visiting 
I have the two captive breeding centers that host uh, the Vizen Wartsi pig, the spotted deer, as well as the necro spinning hotter, and our two partners there actually. And uh, what she she was there to go to is to really help uh, in some ways and have some knowledge transfer. So uh, she went and helped with vaccination. She uh, gave some input on uh, how to weight the animals. Um, she helped also streamline the keeper routine, so trying to make the keeper routine a little bit um, more time efficient and, and more easier. Um, and she also looked a lot into um, improving the diet. So, and uh, what we found when, we, when she was there is to really go a little bit away from uh, grains input, but uh, more like nutrients and micronutrients and uh, foraging, um, um, foraging materials and things like this. Uh, she also uh, provided some input on enrichment and how to improve enclosure. So, and uh, her her presence there. So she stayed one month in uh, the Philippines and mainly in uh, in um, Centrop, which is a captive breeding center hosted by uh, Silliman University, one of our partners. And her her presence there was actually quite invaluable. And uh, our Filipino partner were they're also very keen on on getting this knowledge uh, transfer and on the on cooperating with us on that. So that was really a great aspect where um, it's really exceeded my, my hopes. So that was really good um, good action that we did. And uh, here is some pictures of cute Visay and Varty pigs. Um, and here on the left, you can see that I think it's a, a pig. I'm, I was thinking it was Elvis, but you know, I might be wrong, but it's a keep getting a rub and a little uh, a baby uh, Varty pig on the right that has uh, this um, foraging, uh, kind of materials on the ground. Um, yeah, so captive breeding, uh, we want to continue to do that. So we are regularly uh, transferring funds for um, having some, um, uh, how you say, like uh, supplements for the food of the diet, so the war tipping and the Visayan uh, spotted deer. And we also uh, promoting um, like, you know, maintenance and help with like uh, the cage build. And uh, yeah, so we are working extensively with this to a pre-building center, uh, but I have a logo at the end of uh, my talk. Uh, but yeah. And um, another uh, perspective where we want to look at is uh, the reintroduction part. So this is a, a lovely picture of uh, Kim Kazipe, and she is a young Filipino conservationist, um, and she is actually the uh, science and research officer based at Dan Hugan Island. And so that's the lo lovely island that you can see. Uh, so she's based there, not too bad. Um, it's a very nice place. And um, what she's going to do there is that we're thinking about possibly reintroducing the necro spinning hard dog there. Now, before doing any of this, there is a whole lot of things to do. So we, this, what she's leading is now for the next two years, she's going to look at the feasibility survey. So it's looking at how feasible it is to reintroduce the necro spinning hard dog. Um, so it's looking at, uh, and we are working heavily with Chester Zoo on that. Um, so yeah, Chester Zoo has been really, um, uh, is actually the leader of this project and we're helping out. Um, so what we're gonna look at in this feasibility survey is that for one, we know that there's not gonna be deforestation in this island because it's privately owned and the owner is keen on, the, on keeping this island pristine. And we know there's no hunting because there's no village or community there. So this island is actually a, a high-end uh, tourist place. Uh, so there's about 10 people that are allowed at one time in this island. And uh, there's only uh, two construction where the, the, the tourists can stay. So there's no hunting. Uh, there's just people that are involved in science and research and enjoying uh, the panorama. And uh, so it's very nice and restricted. Now we have to find out whether there's rodents and snakes and reptiles. And so whether this may be a threat to uh, the necro spinning hard off through predation and also predation of the nest, because as you remember, the nest is quite low and so has to be somewhat protected. So we have to look at how much rodents and reptile there is and if it can be, uh, if we can be curved, basically. We have to look at food availability as well. So is there any food for them to survive? Is there any nesting site available? So you have the fern there picture. Um, so is this, uh, is this a nice place for, for this necro spinning hard dog to be reintroduced? That's gonna take a while, but uh, it's good to have a look into it to see whether, because this will be quite a, a, a closed island, so quite a protected population could be there. 
uh, could be also semi-captive, so where you could uh, feed them, but they reproduce on their own. Um, yeah. So that's our introduction part. Now, advocacy. Uh, in June 2019, uh, we had a conservation action plan. And uh, conservation action plan is a, it's a fancy word in conservation for just uh, having a group of people that knows a little bit about the species locked into a room. So literally this room, we were locked into that for four days. There was no window. <laughs> it, was, um, it was not very exciting. You couldn't see anything. We were in the Philippines, but you couldn't see outside. Um, and so you're locked into a room and you try to find out what do you think are the biggest threats of this, um, this species. And as you can see, you do a lot of post-its. So you can see in the background, you have all the post-its of these threats and what are the drivers of these threats? So what are the, the, the reason these threats appears? And, um, and so mainly for the necro spinning hard of was for habitat loss, possibly hunting, invasive species, disease. And you try to understand how these threats pans out and which one is the highest category. And, uh, and then you try to design 20 year goals, uh, thinking about in a, in, in a great world, then in 20 years, where do you see this, this species going? How do you see this species doing? And then backtracking and trying to find what are the objectives and aims you have to reach in order to reach these 20, 20 years goals. Um, and so we hope that this uh, conservation action plan done with uh, the, um, um, the collaboration of the conservation planist, planning specialist group. So we hope that this will be published by the end of the year. And with this uh, brochure, then we, don't, we try not to keep it only to ourselves. We try to share it, to share it to funders. Uh, we try to share it with uh, lawmakers and uh, government um, representatives. We try to uh, share it with, um, with the local community as well. And uh, one thing that I have really, something that really uh, I care about is uh, potentially in there in conservation action plan is to uh, design a new protected area that is quite close to the peninsula that we saw in the map to the Northwest Panay. Um, there is an area that is quite close. It's lowland forest, it's not protected. It looks pretty good as a forest. And if we could, do this as a protected area, then that will be really good because they will allow a little corridor for the negro spinning hard dove and other species to expand. And, uh, and I think it will be a good thing. So this can help me argument with all the relevant parties um, for this. Um, so that's the conservation action plan. So that's in conclusion. Um, so we are trying to protect biodiversity uh, through these five different initiatives. So trying to go through different angles to achieve really the protection of uh, the necro spinning hard of and the visa and what peak, which are our flagship species. What is a flagship species is a poster species. So a, piece, a, a species that you put in your poster that you use for raising funds, but they are usually, they are a species that represent the whole habitat. So we're trying to protect uh, the whole forest with, this, um, with these two species at heart, of course, but we are trying to protect the whole forest. And so we are using these five initiatives to be able to do that. Um, and yeah, so that's what I would like you to, to remember for tonight. Um, I remember looking at a lot of conservation talks and always wondering what I could do. And, uh, and I find it sometimes frustrating because I'm like, I'm here in the UK. I don't know what to do for that. I don't know how to help. So here is a little slide on that. I mean, any bits do. Uh, I think that possibly if you can, then you, you could buy products that have a tick tree, the FSC uh, product. So that's Forest, Forest Stewardship Council. And so that means that uh, any paper, toilet paper, kitchen paper, anything that has this tick tree, means that um, the paper was produced by a tree that was sustainably sourced. And so as a consumer, it's a really, it's very easy. It's very well advertised. It's something that is quite good to do. And so I would advise you to do that if you want to, to make a change. And also, of course, supporting sustainable palm oil. It's not always advertised, but sometimes you have sustainable palm oil in your ingredients um, and uh, being, um, loud about it and, and making a voice for sustainable palm oil. Um, oil is at the base of a whole lot of things and palm oil is actually the one that produces the most oil for the less amount of space. 
I know it's hard to hear, uh, but it's actually, it's a great message, right? So that's why people are, like usually big, big company try to stay away from um, say anything about palm oil. But if you can support a sustainable palm oil, then I think that um, you're trying to, uh, again, trying to find products that are sustainably sourced. The usual, uh, prefer common transport or bikes. I understand that with COVID, it's a little bit complicated, um, but maybe, you know, post COVID, that's something that you can uh, think about and su support your local conservation NGO. Uh, so, there is, I'm sure, a local conservation organization that are close to you, and they might need funding, but they also might need volunteering hours, and, uh, and you know, you can always reach out to them and, and see whether you can help in any way. Um, you may have some very specific talent that you can, uh, you know, share. Um, yeah, so, of course, all this work will never have been possible uh, without the help of all my colleagues in Bristol Zoo. So I talked about Mark, there's also Gronia, of course, uh, my boss, and uh, they are very in really heavily involved in, in, um, in the work that we do in the Philippines, and all these people as well. Uh, I want to tell them Salamat, or thank you, Salamat is thank you in Filipino, in Tagalog. And uh, so Rea, again, with a lovely biker met, uh, Prof. Kurio and his team, Christian Schwartz, Sofia, and Elga Schultz, of course. Um, Dino Fernandez, that is uh, the head of the Terra Larac, uh, Telarac Captive Breeding Center, so you can see on the bottom our partners as well. Uh, Justin Magbuana, uh, Lujin Seria, that works uh, fantastic work in uh, Suleiman University. Um, Kim Kazipe, that you showed the pictures, I, you saw the pictures before. Andrew Owen as well, Owen, that uh, works in Chester Zoo. And my current researcher, uh, Holly uh, Minot and Ilke Geladi, that have worked uh, um, a lot during the, the two months in the, in the field to collect data. And so I want to also thank uh, my founders, and that's the Mohamed Ben Zayed Species Funds, Oriental Birth Club, and Bristol Zoological Society, and many others. And uh, finally, my partners, um, which are, I mean, conservation is all about collaboration, right? So. Um, Pilincon, Talarac, Slim University, and Chester Zoo. I want to thank you all. And uh, I know it's night time in the Philippines, but you might see the video later. <laughs> uh, and that's my, that's it. That's it for me. So thank you so much for listening. Um, uh, I would like to um, uh, to highlight that uh, Bristol Zoo Society are still working hard behind the scene and caring for our animals and. Um, and supporting our field project uh, despite the lockdown. So uh, we're still having work to do in, in the field, um, you know, funding the rangers, deploying the camera traps, etc. So work doesn't stop uh, even with the lockdown. And um, so we have a Bristol Zoo appeal that I know Mark talked about a little bit earlier, but here is a link as well. And um, if you have any questions or anything, there are my emails um, uh, in the bottom. And that's it. So um, I welcome any questions you have. <laughs> Sorry for taking a little bit longer. Daphne, thank you very much. That was fantastic. Um, we're going to we're going to maybe go on until until perhaps ten past or quarter past, just to allow time for questions. Um, Daphne, can you see the chat in case anyone wishes to post a question on the chat? Now you ask me. I'm not sure. Can you read them? Um, thus far, oh, there we go, we have our first question. Lewis asked a question. Do you think fixed acoustic monitoring, e.g. with something like audio moths, would work for the doves, or would there be practical difficulties? I think it would work. I mean, uh, it's not the first time we, we think about that. I think it's a very good question, by the way. Um, we tried to raise some fun for that. Uh, I think... So I think audio moth is good because they can catch like you can they are not too expensive and you can really spread them right so that's really good because uh, I've I've heard friends working with uh, acoustic monitoring that are quite expensive that are kind of like camera traps and the the negro spinning heart call is really low so I mean I played the call and I thought that the bird was far far like 40 50 meters away when I saw it it was just 10 meters away so I was really baffled that how close it was and how far it sounded. So I wonder if you will be able to catch the sound, but you know what? I mean, I think it's worth trying, especially because it's, it's affordable. So, so yes, I think, I think it's a great idea and it's possibly something we have to try. 
Um, I mean, I know friends of mine that are working in Africa and then like gunshots are great for that because you can hear it very far away. Loud calls of baboons, great as well because you can hear it far away. So I don't know how it goes with um, like quieter um, sound. So maybe if, if you have ideas and such, or like if you know a little bit more about this quieter sound and, and catching the volume of then email me. I would be interested to talk about that. Thank you, Daphne. I have a, a question from Suze who asks, the warty pigs shown in the wild looked almost hairless, yet mm -hmm. the ones in at BZG are covered in coarse hair. Is there a reason for this? That's a really good question. I don't know. I don't know at all about this. Um, I mean, there might be some seasonality effect. Again, like in captivity, you know, you're rather well fed. So um, it might be that they're just like really lucky and eat a lot and, and therefore produce this. But that's a really good question. I don't know at all. Um, I'm not sure. Yeah, I, I think there's not much known about this species as well. So it would be cool to look at it, but that's a really good idea. Yeah. Thank you, Daph. Um, Kimberly asks, do you monitor other species in the habitats or just the flagship species? No, we monitor a lot of uh, species. So like the, what is it, was 54 bird species. So uh, for like, say, the wild honey hornbill, we got a lot of like spotting of the wild honey hornbill in uh, the two months we did this year. And so we're going to try to do some population estimate uh, of this. I mean, to be fair, all, all animals. Obviously, there is like your method is based on the flagship species. So say my camera traps, they are not facing up, they are facing down and on the ground because I'm interested in um, the Necrosplinia mm -hmm. hardoff with its ground railing. So it stays on the ground and the warty peak, so it catches all. But like say the leopard cat, I can catch it with the camera trap because they're also ground railing. So, so we're interested in all the species. We have a limited time. Uh, but so, you know, I'm very happy to share my data if anybody is really interested in, in other species that occur there. So I'm happy with collaboration. Thank you, Daph. Um, so actually, if the, the following questions, you have somewhat answered already by talking about all the other species. Um, but a question from Benjamin is, that is basically that these, these projects can be quite costly and you're focusing on two species. So on what metric do the, does the zoo base its decision um, to invest in the different projects? Uh, like the Philippines or the species? It's unclear from the question, but um, mm -hmm. you interpret that as you wish. Okay. Uh, how do we base our metrics to fund uh, something? So we have, so one thing that I think is important for the zoo and for us, and I think it's quite cool, is that um, we are trying to be very... Um, um like i don't know i don't want to say like so return on investment that's what our, our why so we're trying to really use the funding but not just like send it off because we think it's good but actually testing whether what we are doing is achieving what we want to achieve so a, a lot of the way that we invest funds is based on how much do we think um this investment is gonna um is gonna be successful uh, in terms of funding, it's also a bit, if it's between projects between the zoo, like within the zoo between projects, it really depends also on, on the funders and uh, the, the type of funding bits that come up. So, um, so we've been quite successful actually, uh, the, the, the Philippine project, and there is few bits coming up for the, for like Southeast Asia, so South, South Asian, SE, right? Uh, Southeast Asian, I think, yeah, Southeast Asian uh, species. Uh, and so there's few bits coming up, but there are some uh, species that get less funding, right? And some, some species that get more. I mean, like gorilla, you know, like it usually gets nice, good funding. I'm sure Gornia will not agree with me on that, but I mean, it's a, it, you know, it's a quite attractive species. Negro spinning harder, very attractive as well. So a lot of people are rooting for this bird and very interested in it. Within the birder uh, community, people love this bird. Uh, so that's actually, we're quite lucky with that. But so, it depends on the funding and the funders um, and and the, the way that we implement the funding, it really depends on how our, so we design key performance indicator and we measure them yearly and, and more often actually to try to check how well we're doing and whether like, you know, we reach a, 
um, a dead end um, with some aspect and initiative. So, so for the five initiatives I talked to you about, it seems so far to be quite successful. There's initiative that we had to drop along the way as well um, because they didn't look like they were yielding as much success as we putting effort on and funding. Thank you, Daph. Um, so there's a, a question that, which is about captive breeding. Um, I'll just read it out. The Philippines has sent other species like the warty pig and two other bleeding heart species to overseas zoos to increase captive populations and reduce risk of disease wiping out the whole captive population. Is something similar planned for the Negros bleeding heart um, only kept in two centers and might we see them at BZG soon? Mm. Good question. Um, well, we've talked about that. Um, I mean, the, so few things, yeah, relating to that. So we've talked about that, but that's the long-term plan. Uh, we are keen and interested to have a negro spinning heart of um, population in the UK and shared among different zoos. Now, a uh, few things we need to achieve before achieving that. We need to first reach a certain a good, healthy population in the captivity. Right, because 88 individually is just is not much, and they're quite precious. So we want to achieve about 150 or more individual in captivity in the Philippines before transferring any 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 birds uh, of the species. Um, uh, there is talks between uh, zoos that are a part of IASA and us by IASA uh, to to actually yes have um, a, a population captive population outside of the Philippines as well. Um, for now, so we, this is, this is, you know, this takes ages. <laughs> um, I mean, there's like tests and there's like government paperwork and things like this. It's in the pipeline, uh, but it's slow moving. So yes, hopefully, but I don't know when, especially with the COVID, Oof, then, yeah. Thank you, Daph. Um, I'm also being made aware of the fact that there are additional questions currently being asked on Facebook. I suspect that we won't potentially have time to, to get around to those. However, if it's okay, um, I'll collate any additional questions that we have and then send them on to you. And then if you, if you have time to, to make, give us some answers, that would be great. Yeah. And then um, uh, you're all welcome to email me as well. Yeah. If you have any questions, I'm happy um, to answer any question and to, to chat as well. Um, we are looking for, you know, help, collaborator, funding, anything. And uh, I'm always happy to talk about, you know, the decision we make at the zoo and, and, and yeah, chat about that. Um, so in that case, perhaps one, one quick mm -hmm. last question, which does relate to a lot of the things you've already said, which is who chooses which species become flagship species? Very good question as well. Uh, and I had this question in a, in a radio interview once. Ha. Um, <laughs> and actually, yes, it probably is going to be the same answer. Um, who choose what are the flagship species? So, um, um, so you want this species to be, I mean, in general, yeah? So you want this species to be, at, like, not attractive, but like, that, that uh, people would care about. Um, so, for example, like plant conservation is really difficult and because uh, people don't always boot for plants, unfortunately. Um, even like, say, you know, some species of like invertebrates are quite hard to raise fun for. So usually flagship species, you want to have species that are quite uh, um, attracting in attention of the public and potentially funders. Um, Negros Bleeding Hard Dove, it's been quite a long story, a love story between Bristol Zoo and Negros Bleeding Hard Dove. Um, as you can see, it's becoming late. <laughs> um, but yeah, why do we choose the Negros Bleeding Hard Dove? So we thought that, um, so Bleeding Heart are quite interesting and we have two species of Bleeding Heart in the zoo, actually. We have a Luzon and the Mindanao, if I'm not wrong. Um, and, and so we have two species of bleeding hard dove. We were really keen on, on trying to protect the Negros bleeding hard dove because um, we knew that it was critically endangered and was facing heavy threats. So in our eyes, this, this Negros and Panay Island actually really needed our attention and our focus. And that's why we chose that. Um, one project leader that has worked with me a lot is a curator of birds. Uh, so that's actually also um, driven a little bit of the attention towards birds. And um, the Negro Spinning Hard Dove is uh, one of the Visayas, Visayan five, right? So 
in Africa, you have a big five, but there is a Visayan five as well in the Philippines, if you didn't know about this. And uh, that's the two species of horned deer, the spotted deer, the Visayan warty pig, and uh, the necrospin hunter. And so this also drives our interest. If they are a species that is charismatic, that people care about in the Philippines, and that's why we uh, choose this flagship species, which serve as an umbrella species. So umbrella that protects the whole habitat, right? So once you have this umbrella species, the species that drives funding and interest and attention, then you can protect the whole habitat. So we care about the inverts and the reptile in the Northwest Panay and, and all this uh, Panay Negros Island. Um, but we use this flagship species to really attract the, the funding. So. Thank you, Daphne. Um, I believe that we have more questions coming in on the Facebook page, many of which are to do with when the zoo will, will reopen. Um, yeah. So for those questions, I direct all of you um, to, to keep your eye on the Bristol Zoo website for more announcements. Um, Daphne, if that's okay, I think maybe that's all the questions that we have time for. Again, thank you very much for a fantastic talk. Thank you so much for your attention, your interest. Thank you. And um, yes, and you know, the last sentence, we are saving what left together, we are. so. Well done, everybody. Thank you, Daph. Um, mm -hmm. Would you mind unsharing your screen and then I will share um, the next conservation lecture if I can. Let's see if I can do that. Share screen. Uh, there we go. Can, every, can you see that on your screens? I can. Yes, okay. So just to let you know that in a fortnight's time, we're going to have Jen Nightingale and Jen is going to give us a talk about UK native species conservation, which is incredibly important. And she's going to talk about the quest to save the UK native crayfish from extinction. So we look forward to, to seeing you all then. Thank you all very much for, for coming along this evening. Let's think now. Is there anything else? Um, so fairly soon I will stop stop all these recordings. Um, so that's that's the end of the lecture and that's the end of the questions. Um, usually at the end of one of these lectures, I wish you all um, a healthy fortnight, which I'd like to do. Um, but also just on a, a personal note, I'd like to thank everybody who's um, currently protesting and otherwise actively working to try to make the world a better, a more just place. And I, I think special mention should go to the Black Lives Matter protesters. So thank you. Um, I should also mention that Monday was World Oceans Day and that this month is Pride Month. So have a wonderful fortnight, everybody, and stay well. And I look forward to seeing you in a fortnight's time. <laughs>